Thanks very much, Kate. Um, I will just try and get my screen up for everyone. There we go. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, really good to, to kind of be here today and talking about this. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about uh, the resilience study that we published as the National Infrastructure Commission uh, just over a month ago, about six weeks ago now. Um, so I'll run you through kind of the kind of high level findings of that um, a little bit um, and kind of talk you through kind of uh, what we did, uh, how we approached it um, and kind of uh, what the kind of takeaways we have are for kind of how you think about uh, resilience in infrastructure. And then if there is time, um, I will focus on that last point, uh, looking at a particular um, project we did with Arup as part of the study, um, which we can sort of use to start looking a little bit at some of the ways that resilience might be a bit different across different infrastructure sectors. So in the interest of time, I'll get straight into it. Um, very quickly, um, just for, for people who aren't familiar with the National Infrastructure Commission, um, we're an independent body. Um, our kind of parent department is the Treasury, but the idea is that we provide independent advice to government on long-term economic infrastructure needs. Um, and by economic infrastructure, um, we're talking very much about uh, kind of, we look at the water sector, we look at the power sector, we look at transport, we look at digital communications, uh, we look at waste and we look at flooding. So we don't consider things like social infrastructure, so no schools, hospitals, uh, etc. Um, we do kind of, as the slide says, kind of four basic things. One is producing a, a kind of five yearly national infrastructure assessment. So looking at the kind of overall long-term needs of the UK in terms of infrastructure. We do specific studies um, that are commissioned by government of which the resilience study is one. We do an annual monitoring report looking at how government has taken account of our recommendations. And uh, finally, you know, goes without saying a little bit, but we do a lot of engagement with kind of uh, practitioners, government, all sorts of different stakeholders um, uh, kind of across the UK. And then just because it's worth dwelling on, we do have kind of three objectives that kind of set out uh, kind of how we approach all of our work, which are in that box on the right hand side about sustainable economic growth across all regions of the UK around improving competitiveness and improving quality of life, of which I think all of them are, are very relevant to to infrastructure resilience. So just because it helps put some of this in context, um, and this was the very first one because we're a relatively new body, um, for those who aren't familiar and a reminder for everybody else, um, we published the first national infrastructure assessment uh, in July 2018, and that covered a range of different recommendations um, about the UK's future infrastructure needs from sort of uh, renewables in the power sector through to, you know, the future of road transport, um, quite a bit in there on resilience specifically around drought and flooding, which has kind of fed into some of our work. Um, but resilience was definitely a topic that um, more broadly, we didn't have time to address quite as much as we would have liked in the first national infrastructure assessment. So um, that's part of why we, we kind of moved into the study um, and spent some time on that. So I'll give you a little bit of background to, to kind of what we did, um, or, or rather what we were asked to do by government um, and how we approached the study. So it's been a relatively long process. Uh, we've been working on this for, for 18 months um, and kind of looking across, uh, not in this case, the NIC's full remit, but as you can see at the bottom of that slide, those kind of four sectors. So not flooding, uh, although we did think about flooding as a hazard, unsurprisingly for resilience, um, we didn't think about um, flooding, uh, flood prevention infrastructure specifically, and we didn't think about waste in this case, just because the, the challenges in waste are a little bit different. Um, so what we did, um, it's been quite an iterative process. Um, We've done quite a lot of research, a lot of which um, we've published alongside the final report. Um, 
we've done a couple of different consultations uh we've done some social research um and we've done kind of that wide range of kind of going from what are the debates what are the kind of information that's out there at the moment both in the uk and internationally around kind of approaches to resilience you know um there's a particular piece in in the terms of reference about what does the public expect and how do they respond which we looked at partly in the social research but also beyond that as well um, and then we've thought about how we might start to think about resilience um, a little bit differently going forward um, both sort of in a kind of conceptual framing sense um, but also in terms of what that means for some some kind of direct recommendations to government and then as I said there's kind of lots of uh, bits of research and pilot analysis that we've done um, as part of this. I won't talk about all of them but um, when the slides come around afterwards that there's links to lots of bits and pieces in there. So oh, sorry skipped ahead um, I'll just go through kind of the key conclusions very quickly um, and then kind of talk about them in a little bit more detail. So um, there's kind of four kind of high level general messages about that we've come up with about how we need to think about resilience. So the first is about the need to to kind of face uncomfortable truths that are out there and, and to make decisions. Um, so one of the things that we definitely have is uh, a kind of discomfort about the challenges, about the trade-offs that are involved, that um, particularly picking up on a couple of points that, that Kate made that are really well made about acceptable losses, about the fact that actually we, we can't expect to prevent uh, all infrastructure disruptions. It, there is a degree of kind of prioritization involved here. You know, resilience does come up at least in the near term at a cost potentially, but also that there are challenges we know are coming and just because they're 20 or 30 years out doesn't mean we can keep putting off the decisions um we do need to face up to those challenges and and kind of start thinking about them now we need to value resilience properly and that's uh both about how we think about it in a in a very process terms do we think about resilience as as part of the equation or or do we just think about uh, efficiency but also in terms of methodologically what's the best way of, of kind of going about this from both an economic standpoint and from talking to, to kind of consumers and thinking in that sense we need to be proactive about planning and testing we can't wait for things to go wrong and then go oh we'll fix this for next time that that's not going to be good enough particularly um, for some of the the big risks that are out there but also you know we shouldn't be completely doom and gloom about resilience it's not all oh there's lots of risks out there and everything's very difficult there are some opportunities um that we can try and seize as well um those do come from some of those long-term needs but they also come from you know technological change as well so there are opportunities out there as well so um in terms of how we think about this we've kind of framed this around uh, a little bit of a conceptual framework which i'll talk about first and then we've made kind of three recommendations to to government that that build off that so the first is about setting and publishing standards and keeping those up to date the second is about carrying out testing and then the third one is about long-term planning so i'll talk about all of those in a little bit more detail as we go through um, but first just a a very quick bit of, of kind of strategic context so specifically thinking about resilience and and, and and infrastructure so the first point is it's kind of the blindingly obvious in lots of ways but we all rely on these infrastructure services and that goes for us as kind of citizens at home uh, but also businesses although you know a lot of businesses are um, as many of us will be I'm sure working from home at the moment um, actually in the last few years for the most part at least at an infrastructure level there haven't been lots of prolonged or widespread infrastructure failures in the uk there have been plenty of failures um, in various instances and even where there have been kind of longer term ones most of these have tended to be quite localized uh, that doesn't mean they're not important but in terms of kind of how we're doing for the most part it's been okay there is a really important question there about you know 
have things broadly worked okay because we've got this right or have they worked okay because we've gotten lucky and the things that could have gone wrong uh, haven't gone wrong uh, probably a little bit of both is the answer to that one and we can come back to that a little bit um, but at the same time even while things have broadly been okay um, we can see vulnerabilities in when we look at recent events um, and these are just some of the ones that have been kind of ongoing and rumbling or, or happened directly while we've been doing the study, the ones on the slide, but, you know, August power cut last year, um, perhaps the most high profile where, you know, we didn't quite understand uh, the interaction between uh, power failure and whether or not trains would continue to run uh, and kind of software issues there didn't become apparent uh, until something actually failed. Um, Obviously, there's a, there's a big kind of COVID-19 lens we can take to all of this. Um, it's worth saying at this point that we did the bulk of the work in this study before, um, before this happened. Um, uh, and most of the kind of analysis we'd done was, was kind of finished by the end of, of 2019. So it's not something that we've addressed specifically in the study. But um, as you'll probably pick up, there are plenty of lessons we think can be learned, but we very definitely haven't looked at, you know, what the government's response has been or tried to evaluate that in any way, in part because it's far too early to do that sensibly, but also just because we, we kind of haven't had the time to do that as well. Um, but it does kind of bring home, as we think about this now, actually, you know, it brings home some of the challenges that we've looked at and that we've talked about. For the most part, infrastructure services have held up relatively well during the, the during the kind of lockdown and working from home. I think a lot of us have been probably quite surprised at how well things like broadband services have, have, have kept up, that we've all been able to kind of sit on webinars and video calls at home. Um, but we shouldn't ignore that that has come at a cost. That has come at um, a cost particularly to people's time. Um, and there's been lots of hard work of people going out, fixing things, making sure that everything continues to work as it should. And then looking a little bit more forward, there's kind of uh, a kind of known set of things that are happening. And that's both major infrastructure projects, but also challenges. Um, Obviously, you know, climate adaptation is a big one, but there's also demographic change, technological change, and probably particularly relevant in the current context, a set of economic constraints that we have to work with in as well. Um, there's also opportunities as well within that. So we, again, we shouldn't lose sight of, of kind of those two. Um, and a couple of kind of specific challenges that we, we should probably think about in terms of when we're thinking about infrastructure resilience specifically um, and these come across quite strongly in the in the report so the first is about complexity um, we shouldn't ignore the fact that all of this is is really difficult it's really complicated there is a huge volume of work out there that has been done looking at infrastructure resilience um, lots of complicated modeling particularly looking at that first theme of dependencies and interdependencies and while it's important that we think about that, there are there are big challenges here um, and it's very difficult to, to kind of address these in some cases, particularly when we're talking about, you know, infrastructure services that are constantly in use. It's very difficult to have down, downtime to kind of fix things or, or, or kind of test systems appropriately. We've got a complicated set of assets. You know, if you think about, say, uh, the rail sector, we've got lots of Victorian assets um, that we perhaps don't know quite as much about the state of as we would like. It's much easier to, you know, build in sensors and things like that if you're building, you know, a new bridge or a new asset of some sort now uh, than to put them into 100-year-old ones, um, particularly if they're, you know, in the case of uh, wastewater, perhaps uh, buried underground. And there's a big data problem here as well, both in terms of do we have it, um, but also when we have it, how do we make use of the, the kind of mass of data that there is. Um, there's a question about incentives and getting incentives right. So as I mentioned earlier, that kind of efficiency versus, uh, for want of a better way of putting it, the gold plating type argument. There's a question of, of who kind of carries the, the cost, but also who receives the benefits of improved resilience. 
and there's some very difficult questions of accountability between sort of operators, regulators and, and government as well. And then, as I said, there's a, a kind of need to face up to these resilience challenges as well, to ask, ask those difficult questions, to face the, the kind of the, the difficult points, both in terms of, you know, what could happen, what could go wrong, what are the challenges that we've got lucky with, what might happen, not to kind of downplay risks, but also to do things like actually, you know, plan for the, the events that we do anticipate as well, to challenge things like groupthink, uh, and the desire for consensus, making sure that we do listen to those kind of dissenting and independent voices as part of the process. So very quickly, um, we'll start with the kind of conceptual bit and then I'll run through kind of the, how this links to the recommendations and, and very quickly through an example. So um, a lot of this duplicates quite a bit of what Kate said and builds on that. Um, so the idea that resilience is kind of a dynamic concept, we very deliberately did not try and do a, a single definition within the study, um, both so that we can start to look effectively across sectors, but also because, you know, this is contextual, this is context specific, um, and we wanted to think about how you can start to embed best practice in a sensible way. So we've come up with kind of six aspects of resilience, um, that we can think about. So anticipate, so this is all about planning, making sure you think about things sufficiently in advance. We've got resist, we've got absorb, we've got recover, and then finally a kind of adapt and transform nexus. So the recommendations in the report are kind of broadly tied to this. So the first one about standards is, is kind of in that anticipate planning phase. The second one about testing is, is kind of making sure you can meet that next set about being able to resist, being able to absorb, being able to recover. And then the final one on long-term planning is kind of very much in that adapt transform space. Um, and as you can see on the kind of right-hand side of the slide, um, we've got, uh, you can at least potentially see this very much as a process. You don't necessarily hit every aspect in the process every time, but you, you can think of it as a kind of wheel to go through, um, particularly, you know, if you are kind of uh, experiencing and then responding to, to some sort of disruptive event. So you can think about it like that, but equally, you know, if a disruption doesn't happen, you, you're perhaps um, skipping particularly the absorb and recover stages of that as well. So I'll talk very quickly about um, how this works in terms of the recommendations. So the first one is about, um, we've asked kind of that government set standards, and this is partly um, getting to that point um, about actually resilience does mean lots of different things um, to different people, and it means different things in different contexts and different sectors, and we shouldn't kind of shy away from that. But that does mean uh, we need to be as clear and specific as we can. So we do need expectations uh, from government about, you know, if you're an operator running, you know, uh, a kind of electricity generation plant, if you're kind of uh, network rail managing the railway, whatever you are, you need to understand what you're actually expected to deliver. And, and we need to be clear about that in part so we can start to evaluate better, you know, how resilient are we? How well are we meeting those challenges? And we've said very clearly in the report that this does have to fall to some extent to government. Um, they are the stakeholder that ultimately is responsible for kind of setting policy direction, but also ultimately, you know, the fact that, you know, the costs of infrastructure disruptions cascade potentially at least across sectors means that you can't think about this within a single sector. You have to be able to take that kind of holistic view of how the systems work and kind of they're the only stakeholder that can make those difficult trade-offs in place there. We also think this is a really good way to get kind of evidence into the process and have made particular points about kind of the independence of that evidence. Again, not to kind of group think and, and the same thoughts, but think about how we can use that to kind of drive um, progress as well and also think about how we we think about consumer views in this as well so we focused a lot on kind of the levels of service that are provided but what do consumers actually want what do they need and how will they respond to outages is a really important part of of what 
of how we do standards effectively. And it's also worth saying, um, again, picking up on one of Kate's point, this isn't just about standards for service. It's also about thinking about what, when is it acceptable for systems to fail and what do you have in place to, to kind of manage and mitigate those failures. The second one around stress testing is about um, kind of identifying and, and responding to and enabling you to plan for those vulnerabilities that exist. So recognizing that, that things that are at least potentially go wrong can be invisible, at least until we look at them or until something goes wrong. That does require some planning in advance as well. You need to be able to kind of test um, and demonstrate resilience. And if we're asking government to set resilience standards, operators need to be able to kind of show how they're meeting those so that you can start to take steps to, to kind of fill the gaps of, of where you're not um, going to be able to meet them. Think about not just kind of what are the known risks, but what could break the system theoretically. So we looked a little bit about some of the stress testing that's done in banking uh, these days and thinking about not just what's a specific risk, but what could go wrong that would cause you to fail. Um, and there's a role for regulators in this process in terms of providing some guidance as well. And then very quickly, um, just running through the kind of the third recommendation about long-term planning. This is one that we've put very much squarely in the something that operators should do because they're the ones who know their systems. They're the ones who know what, what they're required to do and what the challenges they kind of need to meet are. But it's about kind of making sure that we, we do that rigorously, that we do that regularly, and that we don't think about a plan that we've written 25 or 30 years out as something we stick to, but about something we very much iterate over time, you know, respond to new information, to changing circumstances. And the idea that we can use a very kind of distributed set of, of, of kind of plans to build into a, a bigger picture. So using them to think about how we can remove barriers, to think about kind of escalating cross sector challenges that exist. Um, think about how we build in the costs of resilience into planning and think about the challenges that we do need to, to kind of escalate to government. So where, you know, an operator can't kind of take a long term view on and need to steer from government on actually uh, what's going to happen around, you know, how we decarbonize heat networks, how we think about, um, you know, the the challenges of having enough you know charging and uh, renewable energy to enable electric vehicles transition and things like that so uh, kind of using that to drive change very much and then i'll very quickly run through this um which is a, a kind of brief case study of how we might start to think about these in terms of events so we've picked quite a sort of prosaic example um of kind of uh, what happens uh, potentially to railways during a heat wave and how we might start to think about how that applies uh, to the framework. I won't go through the detail here, but just pause a little bit on the table so we can think about actually, if we think about the framework, how do you start to apply that thinking both to, to kind of what works well at the moment, but also where some potential gaps might be. So we've picked up on the fact that actually designing for resilience is something that's really important. And that's something that, that Network Rail do have kind of planned in. You know, there's good practice in, in the specific case study we were looking at about kind of telling customers in advance. And there's a well-established literature on kind of the need for clarity to consumers and that they respond much better when they know something's going to happen. Um, the need to kind of take preemptive measures. Uh, in this case, kind of addressing hotspots in a very light touch way, you know, in the absorb space, you know, running at lower speeds. So kind of reducing your service so that you can still run some form of service um, without providing too much stress, providing substitute modes of transport, all really good examples of how you can think about this differently. And you can clearly see how this kind of links to other sectors as well, hopefully. So, you know, digital, lots of uh, service providers, offer you sort of you know 4G hubs if your broadband goes down that sort of thing um, there's the kind of uh, kind of operational uh, response management bit as well where you kind of have your kind of dedicated emergency response piece um, and then the kind of how do you think think about responding to that event both kind of adapting building back better 
but also you know do we need to think slightly more transformationally in some cases so you know the kind of costs and benefits of, of of doing this are perhaps not quite being met so you know we're going to experience more heat waves in the future given kind of current climate trends at the moment that's not cost effective uh sort of mitigating those isn't cost effective in network rails kind of calculations is that right you know that that's a big question but actually we do need to kind of acknowledge those trade-offs and say you know we do need to think about how we pay for this about how much we prioritize those types of risks so that's a very quick example i'm going to stop there because i know we want um some time to go through some questions um but you know i'll we'll send the slides around and people can think about those in more detail so um i'll pass back to suraj